Each year, Forbes, the magazine, puts up their billionaires list. Number one, Elon Musk, $240 billion. French clothing baron Bernard Arnault. In 1971, he took control of his father's construction firm, Ferre Savignel. Then Jeff Bezos, of course, followed by Larry Ellison, his surname after Ellis Island. That tells you something. He studied maths and physics. The Oracle software chief, scraping by with just over 100 billion. Warren Buffett holds around 100 billion too, along with Gates, who actually gave most of his money away, and Bloomberg. All the way down, this list goes to 2,540th place, with 66-year-old Philippine businessman, uh, Inigo Zobel, his name is, with a shameful mere one billion to his name. And if that's shameful, he shares it with 60 others. Not the money, the place. I've looked closely over those thousands of billionaires, and I can't seem to find your name. Looking at Britain, the Times' rich list tops with 35 billion held by the Indian Gopi Hinges family. Go down to, well, go down 168 places, and there's no more billionaires. Yet, even as I read on to place number 345 with car dealer Doggy Brown's frankly embarrassing £350 million, you still don't get a mention. I have to ask why. Or, really, to explain why not. Why you're not there. I like to think that most of my 10,000 subscribers are intelligent, flexible, adventurous, and while successful perhaps in their own terms, you are not rich. While many of the 3,000 known billionaires are also intelligent, few have wide-ranging interests and almost half had a kickstart from inheritance. Though blowing an inheritance is common, so don't surf out on that point too far. I'd like to spend an hour speaking of those truly interesting backstories amongst them. Like the UK resident Len Blavatnik. That's the Ukrainian-born American-British business magnate and philanthropist, yes, who cleaned up by buying off state industries after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, quite a common practice. Clearly an interesting and intelligent man. But among some 2,500 names on the Times Rich List, there are more than a few boring half-wits, or at least people with very mediocre talents. Even if they are caked, why not you? Why not me, you might think. In short, I couldn't, no, would not hang on to it. And some of the reasons may be similar to yours. You don't have to look far to find thousands of self-help books and courses with advice on how to get rich. Mostly written by people hoping themselves to get rich from you buying their advice book. Billionaire Warren Buffett is an exception with a few self-penned titles Yet hundreds of name traders, they pick Warren clean with copycat advice books. One of Warren's highlighted quotes, an example. Forecasts may tell you a great deal about the forecaster. They tell you nothing about the future. Well, that's uh, timeless. <clears throat> of course, advice doesn't count for much if you're on a running wheel of debt or survival. The distance between most of us and the very rich seems immense, yet when we look at those very human, fallible and error-prone people, we might wonder what the real differences are. 
First of all, remember that those who come to our attention are usually the exceptions. Something unusual has happened. A rare opportunity where, by chance, by chance timing, they were in position to act. The news, the stories, the examples almost all come to us because that person could act on the moment. The people who had medical supplies connections only a phone call away during the COVID outbreak. The backroads transport operator ready and fueled when a war broke out. Good stories, good news, but nothing to learn from. Put aside the exceptional cases. Most of getting rich is kind of dull. And here's the thing you probably don't have the time or the inclination to put aside everything else for the often boring work of running a hugely profitable business. And take a look at your day, your week, after eating, sleeping, pretending to take an interest in work, you won't have time to focus upon and to research a sure thing. You like watching good stuff, enjoy your music, and enjoy time with friends, lovers, pals, to have a laugh. Are there any foundation rules to getting rich? Of course, identify who is ready and able to pay for the thing or service you can get. I can't think of how many times people have gone into business or even crime without having their list of those who will pay, those who want to pay you, those who can pay you. Almost everything else is secondary. Oh, and try not to use your own money. That rarely turns out well. Your own money is for you to spend or hoard, not for business ventures. Another thing, don't look to rich people as the ones who will do the paying. What do you think keeps them rich in the first place? By not paying. Having that notebook of people who have money and want something is just trade the standard method of making money. What is it the people who will pay want? That really doesn't matter. Your job is almost done because you have their names. You keep their names because they don't get the things they want, the quality they like most. And on time, they are hungry for success that looks like their own doing. The next step is to get the things they want quickly. There are some shortcuts in this, but the quickest are often illegal. I've done that in the past, and it's uh, full of traps and risks. On balance, the risk outweighs the benefits. You might think smuggling is all good fun, but people are little chatterboxes, and word will get out. You won't be shocked to know Governments spend quite a hefty sum on agencies whose task is to stop you. Well, not to stop you, but punish you. Governments set up these agencies to make it look like they care and are doing something about unlicensed trading, importing, and making money. They employ thousands of hunters. Unfortunately, there are a number of sad sacks in policing who take that part of their job seriously. It only takes a few good apples to spoil the big, fat, cuddly barrel of lazy corruption we all like. Yet, I suspect you know about trading and are still not rich enough. Just being lazy? No, it's probably not that. It's the ruthlessness part. To become rich, you need to apply constant ruthlessness. Pretend brotherhood or sorority, but rip the heart out of your customers like a wasp feeds from a zombified caterpillar, keeping the poor victim alive, yet unable to use those many, many little feet from crawling away. Being ruthless is tiring, draining, and above all, utterly dull. As well, I for one simply can't summon the false enthusiasm for convincing saps of business propositions that are not really true. The tough part is that real saps 
don't have anything to spend, whereas the kind of people that ruthless people wrap up are usually quite good souls. Yes, are you pitiless enough? Uh, probably not. There's another route to becoming stinking rich that I just know you often dream about. Uh, this is not some 15-year slog running a business, but floats in the mind as a fast-track wealth generator based not on material goods, but on an idea. And that's the illusion, anyway. It's the killer app notion. A perfect example is WhatsApp. And what is it that most holds the mind about WhatsApp? Uh, first, some real stuff. Formed in 2009, WhatsApp used smartphones' internet link to become a free text messaging service. Well, WhatsApp charged a subscription fee of no more than a dollar per year. And at the time, phone companies charged a lot more for that kind of service. Even that tiny fee was dropped after selling to Facebook. And now services include video calls as well as picture messaging. Quite a novelty back then. Keep in mind that a year before selling the company in 2013, even with 400 million users, WhatsApp was $140 million in the red. Despite that, with just 50 staff members, the company was valued at $1.5 billion. The founders and backers, Sequoia Capital, sold to Facebook for a record $19 billion in 2014. The staff did pretty good, but the venture capitalists who'd stumped up some $60 million, I guess, to pay the electric bill, and they raked in 5,000% return on their investment. There are 2.9 WhatsApp users today. Phone service providers no longer charge for calls and messages. They can't. They can't compete. Uh, still, they promote unlimited calls, unlimited messages, as though they're offering something of a restricted value. They're not offering anything. They have no choice. So there's the dream of the killer app. It happened. But not as you'd think, not so directly. I'd say just about everyone in the 90s who gave phone services any thought could see that data by phone should bypass regular phone services. They wouldn't be needed. As soon as you're online, you can freely send any message you like without using the phone part of your phone. In 2007, with the first iPhone, it was obvious. Yet, WhatsApp began not as a text messaging app, but to notify the status of those of an iPhone's contact list. Were they online or not, or work sleep. Users would list themselves at home or in the office, but it was the users who used the status notes as actual messages. The phone companies feebly fought, well, they, they fought back, but clearly it was a losing battle. That's enough on WhatsApp history. The point here is that most of the ideas that have made tech operators into billionaires have been known and imagined as soon as the technicalities allowed. Uber goes back to 2009, and many of these services by app were kicked up by people with experience in peer-to-peer -peer platforms. You might have woken one bright night with an idea for your own killer app, but there's still some geography that's helpful in the borderless World Wide Web. If the Beverly Hillbillies had struck earls instead of oil, it'd still be California with Granny on top with her keyboard, but South San Francisco rather than Beverly Hills. Uh, that would help Jethro with his startup. That's where the venture capitalist eats lunch. San Francisco. In London, they eat talk. Another thing about ideas, they're not worth anything. The time of apps by themselves as a unique thing is long past. And even when it peaked, 
the winners were the people with something up and running. Uh, every service has a smartphone connection now. Ask yourself where your own mind was in 2010 and where it is now, today, as you travel to work, as the city pushes you along. Now, if someone says to me, the future is in AI, artificial intelligence, I feel terribly sad that the only thing that person can think of is trending searches, memes and current phrases. I'm not saying there's no benefit to AI applications, but to use such a general term as though it was, as though it had a power of its own is a sign of ongoing failure. Beware those who do so. It has less useful effect than Dustin Hoffman's neighbor advising the graduate to get into plastics. Is there a road to wealth using AI systems? For an individual, the newer tools offered by large language models like ChatGPT4 offer an opportunity to generate text that is convincingly human. It is convincing because the base program absorbed billions of pages of text from the internet. From that, the program determined the statistical probability of what word is likely to follow the next, and using rules of grammar, word order, and contextual matching, what answers are most probable? Just likelihood. So, if you can make a living from loads of text, books, reports, even analysis, then you can produce at least ten times the content you might now. You could publish large quantities of travel books, school textbooks, even novels, or they are never very exciting. <clears throat> but the work in setting the frame is difficult to automate, and even self-publishing platforms are resistant to robot listing. You cannot easily set and forget. A big limitation. In fact, all of the AI tools available need heavy human input when it comes to producing something profitable. Remember, too, that so far, artificial intelligence public tools are language models, or based on them. So they cannot devise, what, for example, a novel process of increasing battery efficiency and storage by any significant degree. Sure, it can frame sentences that have never been said before, but it cannot work with information it does not have. If a combination of, I don't know, gallium fluoride and an isotope actinium-228 have never been discussed on the web, ChatGBT won't talk about it either. Is AI conscious, you might wonder? Well, it tells fibs, it shows pride can hold a conversation. What can we do that is different? We had our own powerful chat GBT generator patched into our evolutionary progress uh, a few subspecies ago. We primates have self-awareness. We hold that high, but I suppose it would only take a kind of bicameral program of language models with a, a base rule set for physical status to make an artificial intelligence cube act as though it was self-aware. But I mean, there's two th com programs comparing each other. It wouldn't take so much to simulate consciousness or our illusion of it. Uh, the device would still probably burn my toast. No, you're not going to get rich by novelty of that tiny pool of good fortune where people line up like rare planetary orbits to have opportunity, connections, skills, and the means to take control of that driverless train of disruptive innovation. To turn half a million of someone else's money into 10 million of your own in three years would mean tossing the life you have now and becoming someone else. As it is, you don't have that time. You'd forget family, forget entertainment, relationships, exercise, and become someone you don't like. 
There's no work-life balance in the determination to the cause of getting massive wealth. If you're under 25, you've most likely... Well, you're looking into a future that's more fantasy than real. If you're over 45, you'll know of at least three opportunities that slip by, that you let go. Most likely you had good reasons why you loosened your grip. The sour people involved, the sense you were being manipulated, some unwillingness to abandon a passion or an early commitment. A marriage. But a lot could have been done in those 20 years. And you know it. I can offer some options, even a few that are legal. Yet ask yourself this. How many times have you thought of a fine business service? No doubt a few. Of those, how many times had you calculated the upscaling and thought through the self-funding staff training and the way to turn it into a billion-dollar business? Probably never. All of that gets dull quickly. And beyond that, the greatest impediment to great wealth for most of us is time. There will never be enough. Okay, let's just say you inherited half a million at 21. You'd have over 15 million by the time you were 50, provided you invested in but just average property and lived modestly, maybe had another job. Sure, that half mil from the 90s is equivalent to, what, uh, a million in today's money, but it's still an impressive gain. Even a halfwit that had such a start, and giving a small cut to some property manager if he couldn't manage himself, he would appear a clever fellow, wouldn't he? Even if he was simply too boring to blow his inheritance having fun. It just doesn't seem fair, does it? But it is fair, or fair enough. Sure, you could have made some better decisions, cashed out when you got the feeling to fold, or bought in when you could. Yet you wouldn't be the person you are without the experiences you've had. Let's imagine if you'd been in a suspension bubble for 25 years and when you were revived, you could take the 15 million as compensation and walk out into a confusing world, a blank slate like so many people. Or you could forego the money and be injected with 25 years of much soaring highs and deathly despair from which you recovered serene yet knowing, I'd know what choice I'd make. Hmm? What? <laughs> the whole 15 million? Gone? No, no, no. I'd try to settle for, what, $10 million worth of memories and take my chances creating fresh ones with that $5 million difference. After all, there's always a deal to be done. <laughs> 